very young, we see the world around us as a place for constant discovery and analysis. We are very aware of our need to understand our place in nature. Sorting objects is a normal human trait. We show our awareness for the things in our environment by discriminating between objects. When young children sort items, they focus on their immediate sensations, noting if an object is round or sharp, smooth or rough, small or big. Basic level discrimination is the ability to see patterns and differences in everything we experience with our senses. It is only natural that we do this, and we depend on this ability every day of our lives. We live in a world where there are large disparities in the way people are treated, depending on their visible traits, their cultural backgrounds, their beliefs, and their personal lifestyle choices. Discrimination has led to prejudice and acts of injustice. Racism has been defined in many ways. Racism by and bias comes from uh, founding a um, distinction about a person or making a judgment about a person that's not uh, based upon that person's individual qualities. The definition of racism to me has to be seen in terms of the structural dimensions, right? Uh, so I'm talking about where we have race, prejudice and power working together. So we have institutions that are built on certain fundamental beliefs, that are built on certain structures that ensure the dominance of one group over another. Right? There are two types of racial bias. One is explicit racial bias. That's based on people's opinion and people's attitude. Another type of racial bias is called implicit racial bias. So it's more of those hidden, implicit, and unconscious bias. In today's cultural scene, particularly in cities where people from diverse cultures have chosen to live in close proximity, and especially where they are gathered together with a shared purpose, we see a natural tendency for people to accept one another for who they are, paying little attention to their differences. Dr. Lillian Ma, Executive Director for the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, has been committed to influencing change in society since her days as a research scientist at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. At one point, I was consulting with Ontario Science Centre in one of their exhibits called um, The Question of Truth, okay? And I always ask that question, why doesn't science study racism? I look at racism more like a phenomenon, and I like to know how it is formed. So I'll give you an example. This example is from uh, Professor John Lennox from Oxford University. And so he always gives this example. Um, suppose there's a kettle boiling, and you ask him, why is, why is the kettle boiling? And he can say, well, I, I, boil, I boil the water because I want a cup of tea. You know, that's why the, uh, the kettle is boiling. That's one way to answer the question. Another way would be, well, the, the water is boiling in the kettle because I apply heat to it and the molecules absorb the heat so it expands, the water molecule expands and eventually gather enough strength that it boils and becomes from the liquid state to the gaseous state. So that's the, 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 the how, the science of why is the kettle boiling. Uh, whereas the first question that is how I make use of that phenomenon and create my cup of tea. It is important for science to study racism so that we understand the phenomenon, how it is formed, the description, the descriptive part of, um, of explaining why there's racism. Researchers in psychology, sociology, and neurology have been studying the roots of racism for decades. While much progress has been made, there is more work to be done in this area. Some scientists believe that science can and should be applied to reduce racial discrimination. Dr. Norman Farb is a neuroscientist in the Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto. He studies the relationship between our emotions and our conscious awareness and decision-making 
by looking at these activities using tools such as fMRI brain scan imaging. And what I'm really interested in doing in my lab is looking at how people can engage in individual practices. Contemplative practices, because I study like mindfulness and meditation and yoga, so things that involve some introspection, some, you know, a structured soul searching in a way uh, that will help people both identify when this sort of in-group, out-group uh, dynamic is arising for them and then learn how to regulate or shift that dynamic in some way. There's a, a very long history of trying to understand uh, stereotyping, prejudice and racism uh, dating uh, back to the 1950s indeed um, where uh, we learned fairly early on that if you make people um, into groups uh, where they have conflicting goals or they have to compete for their goals you immediately get uh, what looks like modern-day uh, racism. <laughs> so people will immediately start to derogate and discount the value of people in their out-group uh, and they'll uh, privilege uh, positive information for people in their in-group and this dates back to studies like from 1954, uh, a really famous study called the Robbers Cave Experiment where they set up a, a summer camp for kids and divided them into two groups. The, uh, I think the eagles and the rattlers, like the snakes, uh, and made them compete for things, uh, for compete for rewards or compete against each other in competitions and, and immediately they started to find um, really disparaging comments being made for uh, the boys in the other group um, that they, uh, no, it wasn't just like a sense of healthy competition, they really started to seem like they hated the people in the other group and thought their group was by far the best. In that same experiment, uh, later in the summer they uh, tried to create one larger group that had to compete together, for instance, to win privileges to watch a movie together at the summer camp. And it, as they started to work together on things and develop a, a what we'd call like a superordinate identity, so a, a larger group identity that included all of the, the boys at the camp, um, a lot of this negativity just fell away. And so that, I think, was maybe one of the first studies. Um, this is by a, a researcher named uh, Sheriff uh, who um, was able to establish that we very quickly form in-group and out-group identities and a lot of the things we associate with modern day prejudice and racism fall out of that group distinction but on, on the positive side that these group identities are plastic right in, in, in the sense that if we are able to uh, forge convincing reasons for why we can work together on things, then you can also um, erode or even erase a lot of uh, these instances of prejudice, the motivation to be prejudiced. Orlando Bowen, now a member of the Board of Directors for the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, is a motivational speaker, founder, and executive director of the One Voice, One Team Youth Leadership Organization. Orlando's professional sports career was cut short due to injuries from a racially motivated assault by the police that almost ended his life. I played hard and studied hard. I graduated twice, did a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. I played three seasons with the Toronto Argonauts. Um, I then played one season with the Hamilton Tiger Cats and had signed a contract extension and was about to go out and celebrate that extension um, when the assault happened. And I see two guys walking towards me and one guy says, hey man, do you have any drugs? And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. No, I don't. And I go back to my phone call. Now he stopped at the rear of my vehicle. The guy that was with him kept walking. So the gentleman that stopped says, are you sure? Are you sure you don't have anything? And I'm thinking, why would he be asking me if I'm sure? I answered his question. They grabbed me. They were both armed. Got me down to the ground. Started to beat me to, you know, skin on my head. Split. And I was there and I was just thinking, I can't believe I'm gonna die like this. It ended up that the two gentlemen were two corrupt undercover police officers um, who were employed by the police service that I worked with a lot. I was a spokesperson for a number of their uh, events and initiatives. I went out with their officers into schools to empower and equip young people to stand up for the right thing. So because I had worked with so many amazing officers who believe in community and believe in young people, I was convinced that, you know, someone was going to stand up and say something. Of course they would. That's what we stand for. That's how we live and that's what we equip young people to do. I knew that that was going to happen until it didn't. And a number of them would come to me privately and say, I, I wish I could say something, but I can't because I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be 
I don't want it to seem as though I'm not a team player. I wish I could help you, Orlando. The assault itself, um, it was a challenge in that it ended my football career because I was concussed and I couldn't even like, you know, I couldn't pass my physicals. I couldn't even like walk without losing my balance. Uh, but uh, while we were going through that process, uh, one of the officers, actually the arresting officer, was himself arrested uh, for trafficking cocaine. They found, you know, um, multiple kilos of cocaine at his house. And um, all I could think was, that's a father, man. That's a dad. That's someone's husband. I can't celebrate the fact that he's, you know, he was charged, he was convicted. I can't celebrate the fact that he's going off to prison. I can't, I can't. As a dad, I can't. As a husband, I can't. As a human being, I cannot celebrate somebody else's pain. So I was acquitted. You know, it, it, was, it was bittersweet, you know, uh, because folks are like, that's amazing. Like, you won. And I was thinking, what did we win? We shouldn't have been in this situation in the first place. We're wasting taxpayers' money. We're wasting our own contributions. We sh these type of things should not happen. So now what is my role in, in doing what I can to ensure that these type of things don't happen as frequently as they do? We still have um, a lot of racism, particularly in the systemic area. Overt racism could have been reduced, but the, um, the systemic issue remains. A prejudice that is, uh, is your opinion, but if you act out something, that would be racial discrimination. Okay, if you act on it so that there's an impact on that person, uh, that would be racial discrimination. Beating people up uh, because um, they are of a certain race, you know, that type of thing. In the 1980s, Ellen Langer, professor of psychology at Harvard University, became known for her pioneering work on mindfulness. Children seem to have a natural ability for it. They need little stimulus to engage in their need for observing, and this moves seamlessly into the next stage of sorting and categorizing. If children do this almost automatically, could we say that it is an innate characteristic of humans? Is discrimination a natural trait that we are born with, or something that we start to learn from the moment we are born? Either way, it appears that humans need to categorize in order to make sense of the world. Alan Langer had written a very interesting book called Mindfulness, which was published some more than 25, 30 years ago. She studied the, the, what she would call mindfulness. She started the, the, the story with the fact that people get into a, a kind of habit of doing things and they, that she called mindlessness. But she also understand that categorization, you know, putting things into various boxes, is important to sort information so that we can make quick decisions for efficiency. Langer points out that our many attributes are what makes us attractive as individuals. Mindful awareness leading to a high level of discrimination results in an ability to see the person as an individual who helps to complete the group. The more we make distinctions between people, the more we see the traits as being context-oriented and not being indicative of differences to be feared or rejected. On the contrary, our differences are accepted by the group and add to the personality profile of the group itself. Discrimination is kind of categorizing. Okay, so categorize people into different color by their color of the skin or ethnic origin or cultural groups and so on. So um, she and she she observed that many of the legislation, many of the ways that we try to tell people uh, to to you know to try to eliminate this sort of racial prejudice, is to tell people do not categorize, do not look at people. Um, so you, you hear people talking about, well, I don't see faces, uh, you know, you, you hear, I don't see people's color, you know, that type of thing. Um, but that is 
to, to her, this method is doomed to fail because you're telling people to do things that's not natural to them, okay? So she said, why don't we look at the, can we fight discrimination with more discrimination in the sense that with more categorization? So your first box is just this, 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 this. that's the stereotyping, right? We stereotype this people do that, this people do that, and so on. But she's look, saying, can we look at it more in, in, into more depth? Look at that person not just as a group. Look at the person as an individual. That's what psychologists are now using this method called individuation. Give the person a name. Find out a little bit more about him or her. This individuation, this actually finding out more, more about a person uh, is the way to, uh, to help us to eliminate racial prejudice or to at least lower racial prejudice. Working in Professor Kang Lee's laboratory for the study of psychological development at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto, PhD student Miao Jin has been uncovering evidence that racial or outsider bias is strongly indicated in very young children, even in settings where they have not been exposed to people from other racial groups. I began this line of research by looking at young children's implicit racial bias because people, especially adults, they always assume that, oh, children, they don't have any type of bias. And now I'm kind of curious about whether that exists in children or not. So I begin to explore this question in China. Because in China, China is a very racially homogeneous society and Chinese children have very limited contact with people uh, from non-Chinese background. So in that case, whether they show racial bias against, for example, black people or white people. So that's why I started this line of research in Chinese children. And uh, unexpectedly, they do show an implicit racial bias against non-Chinese people. I am doing my PhD here now, and I'm very interested in whether Toronto, as a more multiracial and more multicultural society, whether people here, especially children, they have implicit or explicit racial bias towards other ethnicity groups. So I, I started to understand this by uh, recruiting some children to my lab in Toronto to do, to see if they show bias or not. So based on some preliminary results, children here in Toronto, uh, although it's a very multiracial and multicultural society, they do show uh, both implicit and explicit racial bias against other race groups. This is my research assistant, Christy, and this is our child participant, Amani. I am very interested in whether children have implicit racial bias, and if yes, how we are going to do something to reduce that implicit racial bias. So today, I have a participant, Amani, who is doing the tablet game. In this tablet game, I wanted to measure whether kids have implicit racial bias. So th in this game, I ask children to respond as fast as possible to different races. So what I'm interested in here is ask them to finish two blocks. In one block, they have to respond to a smiling symbol when they see an ombre's face and tap a frowning set symbol when they see an other race face. And in another block, I ask them to do the opposite when they see an uh, their own race face, they have to tap the sad symbol. When they see the other race face, they have to tap the happy symbol. So what I'm really interested in here is to see their, their difference in their response time in these two different blocks. And by looking at their response time, I'm able to look into the hidden implicit bias in their mind. If children so young already show bias, is there any hope that we could overcome what some researchers suggest could be a preset, perhaps even hardwired characteristics of the human brain? We know that uh, now that the brain is sort of, can be categorized in terms of a bunch of different functional networks. And by functional networks, I mean 
um, different pockets, pockets of, of neural uh, cell regions that work together to perform a particular kind of information process, right? To, to process the world and our internal experiences in, in a particular kind of way. And I think two of the networks that are most relevant to this conversation are what's known as the default mode network, which just kind of runs along the sort of shark's fin middle of our brain uh, and is responsible for um, helping to integrate our decisions and our thoughts into, into habits. Uh, those habits could also carry uh, overlearned associations that we don't particularly endorse. Right? So it could be, oh, I think that this particular group is less educated. So I mean, if I'm not explicitly thinking like, oh, I'm going to use small words now, like if I have that kind of built-in association of this group uh, is less intelligent or less educated, then immediately it's going to um, it's going to scaffold and structure how I even engage uh, in language without any sort of uh, conscious intent. And that's really the sort of insidious problem with, with these habits. The tonic for that, the, the network that kind of competes against the habit network is called the salience network. And that's sort of located kind of behind the temples here for receiving new information and then for also coming up with new kind of strategies to respond right sort of in the middle of the forehead here. Um, and this salience network is responsible for shaking us out of habits and making, it takes effort and energy, but for taking in new information and coming up with new solutions and feeling emotional impact. We are creatures of habit, like literally creatures of habit, um, but we might have some say as to what those habits are. They don't just have to be the habits that we've in inherited from um, our parents or our, our culture or, or what have you. Um, and there are practices that one can engage in to break out of habit and develop flexibility between acting habitually uh, and uh, taking in new information and dealing with ambiguity, but also being creative. Um, and so when people engage in, in mindfulness interventions, for instance, they learn to flex, uh, flexibly shift between these two networks, uh, this default network that supports habit and the salience network that allows things to change. Um, and so when we bring that conversation back to something like prejudice and racism, uh, the question begin, becomes, well, first of all, can we become aware of whatever habits we have uh, in a kind of open and, and curious way? And knowing sometimes that those associations that we have are not the associations we would choose to have. Um, and then if we notice that we have that kind of uh, habit that we don't endorse, um, then how do we move into the moment and really get the emotional impact of like, well, if I keep going with this habit, it's going to make me and feel other, other people feel worse or make the world less the kind of place I want to be in. So how can I actually then apply um, a, a, or start to create a habit that actually is constructive and adaptive? And this gets this idea of moving away from just like noticing that there's this inequality, which we need to use the salience network to notice, but also then can we um, then start to practice a habit of uh, sharing a collective value, for instance, or moving beyond just the recognition of the inequality into like, how can I come up with a way of characterizing my relationship to another person or a group of people that is inclusive and, and looks at our, our commonalities rather than just what makes us different. So we have three friends here, A, B, and C. Do you want to be friends with A, B, or C? Okay. Why do you want to be friends with B? Cause um she he 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 looks um the skin color looks nice and the shoes are red. Do you like his skin color better because it's like similar to yours? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else about B do you like? It has jeans. Jeans and you yeah. like jeans? Yeah. Okay. A as your friend? Do you want to pick B as your friend? Or do you want to choose C as your friend? C. There are some scientific evidence suggesting that children, especially when they were young, in infants, infancy, they usually prefer those who look like them because they wanted to be safe. They have this, this need for safety. I think the main argument here is familiarity do breeds liking, but we have to pass beyond the familiarity because we know we, are, we have the tendency that oh, we, 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 are gonna, we like to team up with our own race or in-group person. We should really pass the boundary of the categories 
and know more about individual traits. So for example, I am Kitty, I have a name, my name is Kitty, and also I'm a Chinese, I'm a female, I'm a PhD student. I like reading, I like seeing, like those are all those of individual traits that associated with me. So like for other people, the same thing, we should know more about personal traits, personal individual traits. Instead of just categorizing me as Chinese, then kind of apply all those. Chinese are good at math, or Chinese are good at playing instrument to me. So it's like different. One happens at a group level, and one happens at an individual level. So we have three friends here. We have A, B, and C. Do you want to be friends with A, or do you want to be friends with B, or C? E. B, why do you want to be friends with B? Because he looks like a cool kid. He looks like a cool kid? What about him makes him look like a cool kid? Um, but like the kind of stuff he did with his hair and how he's dressing and that kind of stuff. Okay, Jack. So, are any of these friends here, ABC, do they look like any of the friends that you have? Yes. Which one looks like a friend that you have? That one. In early human life, family bands moved from place to place in search of hunting grounds and the best seasonal fruits, seeds, and roots. Danger came from all sides, including from humans outside the family group. Being aware, mindful of their surroundings was critical to survival. Was prejudice possibly a natural human trait developed during these tough times? Some researchers are studying the possibility that deeply rooted unconscious bias may be one reason for outward acts of rejection and hostility towards people who do not fit into our self-defined tribe. <music> Professor George Day at the Department of Social Justice Education at OISE, University of Toronto, is also the occupant of the stool of the Azokorakuma and has been installed as a traditional chief in Ghana. My work is a bit broad uh, in terms of looking at issues of race and schooling, right? But it's not just race and schooling. I'm also interested in questions of knowledge production and how we fight for equity and social justice. So when we talk specifically on the question of race and anti-racism, I'm more interested in how we create communities that are able to address um, the inequities that exist among us. We need to understand racism in terms of its impact on people. The question of responsibility is so important, right? Um, because of the fact that knowledge is powerful, right? That knowledge can be used and misused. And so we always have to be mindful of what we say and also be, be held accountable to our ideas, right? I'm talking about bringing responsibility and ethics to the work that we do, right? So when we produce knowledge, to what extent is that knowledge transformative? To what extent does that knowledge help us to understand our communities, our world? To what extent do our communities find our knowledge is relevant? Professor Day reminds us that once we become awakened to a world that has many people worth listening to, as we hopefully begin to overcome bias, even in small increments, we will see that our Western science is but one way in discovering the world around us. Colonization is anything that is imposed, right? Or some, that is sometimes very dominating. And I think we have to look within our own practices, in our homes, in our schools, in our churches, in our workplaces, right? How are we engaging in colonizing practices? Colonizing practices can be denying people's experiences, denying their stories, trying to impose our world, trying to impose our knowledges, trying to impose our understandings on others. Those to me are very colonizing. Any community is as good as we collectively work to make it. How do we ensure that the way we deliver education right, becomes inclusive. That means holding institutions accountable. How do we ensure that our students see teachers who reflect the diversity of bodies that we have in our communities? Women, people with disabilities, indigenous bodies, racialized bodies. How do we ensure that diversity? How do we ensure that the curriculum is inclusive of the different experiences, that we are not talking about just uh, the particularity of one experience, 
We are talking of the collective experiences. And that means talking about institutional responsibilities. How do we ensure that those who have power and influence in our institutions use that power to address questions of inequities, inequalities, oppression in our communities? Professor Banaji worked with Anthony Greenwald at Ohio State University in the 1980s, where she received her doctorate for work that would challenge the way we understand the workings of the human mind and brain. For decades, experimental psychologists have been aware that testing people on their perception of simple visual images that compete with one another for our attention could reveal a dissonance or hesitation in the brain's ability to decode what it is perceiving. Our association with written words and their meanings is so strong that we can't easily overcome the bias against saying out loud the font colors only. If the words are not associated with colors, as in the second list, it is much easier to say the font colors out loud. This effect was discovered by German researchers in the 1920s and then made famous by John Ridley Stroop when he first published the effect in English in 1935. Greenwald and Banaji continued their work together in the 1990s when they developed the Implicit Association Test, the IAT, a powerful tool that reveals hidden qualities of the very foundations of our working brain. Dr. Huli McLaughlin is an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. He served as Chief Science Officer and Vice President of the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto. He discusses the science of racism with Professor Will Cunningham of the Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto. Dr. Cunningham's research involves a social cognitive neuroscience approach for understanding the cognitive and motivational process underlying emotional responses. Dr. Cunningham did his PhD work at Yale University under Mazarin Banaji and Marcia Johnson. He was directly involved in the early development of the Implicit Association Test, IAT. We're here to talk about racism and specifically the science of racism. And I know that you've been working on this for many, many years in your professional career as a psychologist. And I wonder if you can just give us just a, a brief setting of so how you got into it. What, what, what motivated you? Oh, it, it's interesting. I think that the interest in the prejudice racism part per se kind of fell out of a general interest in how do we actually construct our conscious experience, right? How is it that we understand the world around us and the fact that a lot of that is constructed from things behind the scenes. Right. And, but I got interested in the area of racism and prejudice, particularly in graduate school when I was working with uh, Majin Banaji, Liz Phelps, and Marsha Johnson at Yale University. Yeah. And it was a great time to be there. That, because at that time is when the IET was just being developed. We were trying to figure out new tools for looking at things like prejudice. Uh, we started using brain imaging to start to understand things like prejudice. And it was a very exciting time. Greenwald and Banaji created timed implicit association tests to investigate our deeper level bias on a number of binary traits, male versus female, old versus young, and black versus white. In one of the tests, subjects for the implicit association test were tested for race-based bias. They were first asked to assign black faces and unpleasant words to the left and white faces and pleasant words to the right. It took about 23 seconds. Then the subjects were asked to do the test again, but this time they were asked to assign the faces of black people to the left-hand column of the circles along with pleasant words and the faces of white people to the right-hand column, along with unpleasant words. It took 40 seconds. Subjects in these tests tended to stumble and slow down when asked to associate white faces with unpleasant words on one hand and black faces with pleasant words on the other. The IAT really took off, though. Yes. It became the, 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 pro, the, uh, the tool, the psychological test that everybody's heard about. Mm -hmm. When you were studying it back in the, in the, in the late 90s, when you did some of the first papers with, with Banaji and others. You published in academic journals. Mm -hmm. And the publications were stating that we think we're onto something. Right. We know that things like bias does occur. Yes. Right. And so when you have a tool that says, 
oh, look, here is further evidence of something that you believe is true. Yeah, because we believe it's true. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's not hard to make the, the leap that what this measure is giving us is the same thing that we might, that we think we're observing in the world. Right, so I'll say even my own writing was probably a little more optimistic about. Banaji and Greenwald and other researchers working on the implicit association test speculate that the definition of self has been skewed toward the white race as a default in a society where all the positive images, role models, and authority figures are white and where so many images of black people are associated with crime, poverty, and deviance. Could changing media images change underlying prejudice for people of all races? The pairing between a group, it was a, 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 a skin color associated right. with goodness and badness is the one that keeps on hitting yes. the, the popular press, yes. the popular media. When we get into what the IT is measuring, mm -hmm. I know that that's where the popular version of what's going on has been separated more or less from what's been going on in scientific yes. circles since the late 1990s. Can you sort of give us a sense of what that is? How, how are these two different uh, approaches to looking at this incredibly powerful tool, how they differ between the popular pr version and the uh, academic version? If you're someone who has prejudices, yes. right? If you are someone who, say, doesn't like, say, people from Africa, you will be someone who will show a pro-white, anti-black bias on the IAT. Will show, if you have prejudice, it will show up on the IAT. Exactly. Yes. But yes. having a high IAT score does not necessarily mean that it's because of prejudices. So you could get a higher IAT score for some other reason, which means that you can't tell in the group of people, I'm just asking this, yeah. If you have, if you have um, 90 percent of a group that's showing a prejudice when they've done this test, a distinct one, some of those people will be there because they actually have this prejudice, yes, right. put it simply. Others will be there for another reason or right. several other reasons. Yes. Can we discuss what those other reasons could be? Well, so it's interesting. Like, for example, if somebody recognizes that a group has actually had prejudice against them, right, so you know that a group has been treated unfairly, right? That's one reason you can associate bad with that group. So if you, if you know that people of African descent are treated badly, the IIT test can't differentiate between that knowledge? No. Right, so basically one reason is you can say that somebody is bad, has, you know, has been had treated unfairly, that it's badly off, and so one reason to have a high IIT score is actually the fact that you have very strong egalitarian values. Right, so in noticing difference, another thing that which comes in, especially with some of the stereotype versions, is acknowledging what's actually happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Right, so if you actually see that some groups, right, might actually, for whatever reason, historically, have been associated with poverty, knowing that that's happening will also show up in the IAT. Right, and so in some levels, when we have this goal of reducing the IAT to zero, Right, we're in some ways flipping the cart and the horse. Right, what we're talking about is we don't want people to be treated unfairly as a function of, say, their race group, their religion, but simply acknowledging or having knowledge that certain groups are badly off. Right, you, you need to know that you to be that. able to do something about it. Professor Hart Blanton at the University of Connecticut Department of Psychology, based on results from his own testing, has challenged the work by Banaji and Greenwald for its relatively low significance when tested statistically and for its lack of precision, pointing out that the results do not reveal much about the nature of the physical basis for the speculated hidden trait. The underlying physical mechanisms are too complex for us to explain in a simplistic way. Researchers in this emerging joint field of human psychology and neurobiology point out that the results may derive from the association of race with poverty, and therefore negative imagery may be connected to worry and pity. One of the experiences that I had was a media stereotyping story that happened to, to me and many of my um, Asian community friends uh, in 1979. There was a program by W5 called the Campus Giveaway. 
And um, in that program, it is, is a story about a Canadian who could not get into U of T, to University of Toronto, uh, pharmacy class, because, you know, the, 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 the theme of the program is, because foreign students are taking over the university. It's called the campus giveaway, okay? And whenever they, they talk about the foreign students, they would show Asian faces, and in fact, many, many Chinese faces, because I know the students there. And whenever they say the Canadian person who cannot get, a student who cannot get into uh, U of T, or University of Toronto Pharmacy, it was a white girl, okay? So it was so distinct that um, after it was shown, we were so upset because we were worried that walking around the campus, somebody is going to say, well, you are the foreign student that take over our campus. And so many of our you know, brothers, sisters, or whoever uh, uh, who are Canadians could not get in. In fact, nothing could be further away from the truth. The, uh, the, um, the Chinese students that they show in the pharmacy class, or the Asian students that were shown in the, in the pharmacy class, were all either Canadian citizens or permanent resident status in Canada, okay? So the fact that they only show one group, you know, the, the Asian students face and say that they are foreign, give a wrong impression that foreign, you know, or Asian or Chinese is equivalent to foreign. And so, we, of course, protested because, you know, we were very upset about that. I can see that very well-educated people in doing their work, uh, particularly in the media area and, and, and others too, you know, in justice area, in health area, in many other employment area, human resource people, they could, they may not be aware of some prejudice that they may have. And so that can exemplify in their work that can be expressed eventually in their work when they have discretions. And once we start looking at it like it's a us versus them, we've lost, right? So there are some biases that we all bring to the table that are, I think, uh, connected to our experiences and, and, and what we um, maybe learn or live vicariously through media or through other people that we know um, that don't allow us um, to be ready to just embrace people. I, I, lo I love people. Um, and, um, you know, I treat people that way. You know, and it doesn't matter if I'm meeting them for the first time or, or, or not. Like, we're family. That's how I treat people. All right? Maybe we're just family that happens to be meeting for the first time that day. My grandparents and parents have uh, set the example for me in terms of how to treat people and to understand that it's about community. But in that same way, there are others who are learning other types of behaviors in terms of how to treat people. And it's not always with respect. And sometimes it's because of what they look like. So if we can model what, we, what we're asking people to, to move towards and, and, and let our actions speak louder than anything we could ever say, I think we'll have a shot. The one thing that all researchers and practitioners seem to agree on is that we are finally turning our attention to this important issue of bias in our society. There's a few different ways I think science can be helpful uh, in uh, attempting to combat prejudice and stereotypes and racism. It's not good at telling us what we should care about, right? Like we kind of have to decide what's important to us, but science is really, really good at, at determining whether a strategy is going to produce the desired outcome, right? Like science is all about like if you do X, do you get Y and do you get it like in a replicable or, or sustainable way? So first of all, in establishing where there is inequality, science can do a great job at that. And I think that is still an important battle. To, to me, it seems a little crazy that it still is, but st some people still walk around saying there isn't a problem here. Like, oh, in the 70s, people were racist or in the 60s, but no, that's done now. The other area where science can help, I think, a lot is by evaluating whether different strategies to then resolve those problems are effective and to compare strategy effectiveness. So it's not going to, it's never going to tell an employer that they should care about equality. Like maybe if science shows that there's a big problem, people will start to care. If they know their stakeholders or the public cares, they'll start to care. 
but once they ha have that kind of motivation, yeah, I, I want to like do transform myself or the people around me for the better. It can start to adjudicate between different options and say this option actually seems like it consistently produces results and this one doesn't. It's not enough to speak about racism and other forms of oppression. We have to act to improve and transform our communities. How do we use that knowledge, our understanding, which can be a theoretical understanding, and be able to address and transform issues for us? Uh, and this is where I think the question of experience becomes very, very important. We cannot simply engage questions of racism in the classroom as an intellectual exercise. We also have to see how racism is real in terms of the material, the political and economic consequences that it has for people. Right? Because sometimes when we intellectualize on these issues, we end up denying the experiences of peoples. We end up sometimes even becoming very skeptical, right? When in our skepticism, all what we're doing is denying these experiences. It would be helpful to everyone to, to learn a little bit more about science. Uh, try to uh, look at things more objectively, uh, using the data that's, that's, that's studied, um, and using the data that is available, that is collected, because everybody affects everybody. I'm affected by the people who sit next to me on the TTC train, just, you know, just give an example. Um, and, uh, and, and going, asking questions is, is the right thing to do, and dialoguing is the right thing to do. And hopefully through these um, means, uh, using science to, to understand the world, is going to help Canada, uh, generally speaking, and to help the, wo the world, generally speaking, uh, in terms of human progress. Some young people were involved in an anti-racism public service announcement, and here's what they had to say about racism. Racism to me is the belief of dominance of one race over another. Racism is when people are discriminatory towards others because of their beliefs and the race and how they look. Racism to me is when um, people are discriminated on their race and what they believe in. For many of the participants in the anti-racism PSA, the subject of racism is one that must be addressed together for harmony to reign in society. We have to accept like, each other's differences and come together as one in the community. So many people need to be educated on this topic and I think it's really important because there's so many issues in our world that need to be solved and uh, with uh, less har racism uh, that accounts for more harmony so that would allow us to uh, work together to eradicate many issues that we face. Racism is a very important issue in society and even though some people think that it's already been addressed and that it no longer exists, it still exists against many different ethnicities and it needs to be addressed because it's a it's a stupid thing really it doesn't make any sense there's no reason to be racist it's only bad for everybody it's not good for anybody in grade one a boy told me that black people were ugly when when he told me that i i was crying and everyone was there to cheer me up and what i learned was that from that was that there's a special message and it's that everyone's beautiful in their own way and, and everyone's different so they could have dif a different skin color, a different rel religion and different traditions. People who are being like bullied and abused feel really bad and hurtful so this was a good opportunity to spread that message to people to stop. Can we discover enough to understand why the necessary action of sorting is so closely aligned with discrimination leading to prejudice? Can we find new ways to open our minds to be less prejudiced? The application of science and knowledge from all our many world cultures as it applies to our everyday human lives has never had a greater purpose.
Thank you.